With schools starting this week, concerns over the Delta variant continue to loom. How one district is working to prepare for their first day of school with health and... Connecting the Brazos Valley, this is KRHD News. Thanks for joining us for Care HD News at 5. I'm Hallie Jones. For many schools in our area, students and staff will be walking through the doors tomorrow bright and early. Today, districts are preparing in a number of ways with safety and precaution in mind. Care HD News reporter Hannah King shares what one district in the Brazos Valley is doing to prepare for the big day. District-wide, almost 2,000 students will be walking through the doors in Caldwell Tuesday. I think that's more important this year even than last year just going back without masks on and not having as many mitigating factors as we did last year. Um, I think taking every precaution that we can to help keep our kids healthy and our staff healthy and our schools open, um, you know, we're going to do what we can. Similar to last year, the district held drive through COVID testing Monday exclusively for Caldwell ISD students and staff. Just before we get ready to go back into school, you know, we thought we'd offer an opportunity for parents to bring their kiddos by or for staff members to come by. Ayer says some parents are concerned while others are simply cautious. Regardless of reasoning, the importance of testing remains. And even today, you know, the first few people that we've tested actually came back positive and didn't know that they had symptoms maybe you know, hadn't been in close contact. And so it's a couple of students that may have shown up to school tomorrow um, with COVID and not even known it. Eliminating the spread with a quick test, this great grandmother is so thankful for this proactive approach. Because all of the kids, we got to try to protect everybody, not just the kids, but everybody. Ayers, the district nurse for Caldwell ISD, says while they are not requiring testing, all of their campuses have rapid tests available on site if needed. I think we're one of the few um, districts in this area that are actually providing the rapid test. Um, and I, I found this last year being in such a rural area. Um, testing is not readily available like you might find in like Bryan College Station. And so, like I said, we utilized it a lot last year. While this nurse would have liked to see a little more traffic come in for the event, she says with the turnout they did have, it was well worth it, even catching a few cases. In Caldwell, Hannah King, KRHD News. Taking a look now at the newest data for COVID cases in schools. These numbers are from the first week of testing for this school year. Of over 5 million students on school campuses in Texas, 829 have reportedly tested positive for COVID-19. With teachers and staff, 872 of the just over 800,000 teachers have tested positive. The Texas Department of State Health Services says they will update these numbers every week. Children under the age of three may be more likely than older kids to spread COVID-19. The article from GMA Pediatrics contradicts earlier studies that suggested young children were less likely to spread the virus. The authors believe their research could better reflect the real world risk at the moment as schools begin to reopen. The Mayo Clinic says children should eat a consistent diet with protein, especially lean meats and poultry. Fresh fruits and veggies should also consistently be included in their diet. Whole grains such as wheat bread, oatmeal and quinoa are recommended over things like white bread and white rice. Added sugars, saturated fats and sodium are all things parents should limit for their kids. For more information about what your child's diet should look like, visit mayoclinic.org. And as kids go back to school, here are some bus safety tips for, from the College Station Police Department that you can teach your kids. The CSPD suggests staying at least five steps away from the curb while waiting for the bus. Once the bus arrives, wait for it to come to a complete stop, then wait for the bus driver's signal to board. Once your child finds a seat, they should face forward in that seat. And finally, look left, right, and then left again while exiting the bus. And for the latest on back to school in the Brazos Valley, connect with us online. Pull out your phones, open the camera app, and scan the QR code that's right here on your screen. A notification banner will pop up at the top of your phone screen. Tap that banner to access our website and all of our social media accounts. Today marks exactly one week since the Bush Library and Museum was advised to close their doors. With COVID cases back on the rise, the Bush Museum and Library was closed until further notice and employees have returned to working from home. Warren Finch also worked for the National Archives for years, coming to College Station in 1993 along with all the records that stand in the building today. But even he says he's never seen anything like this before. COVID numbers are back up all across the country and here in the Brazos Valley and 
The National Archives has parameters for when we can open and when we have to close. Putting things into perspective, according to the Brazos County Health District, the local positivity rate is averaging right at 8%. An investigation continues this week after a party boat capsized in Lake Conroe over the weekend. An 80-year-old man died when the double-decker boat overturned in four to five foot waves Saturday evening. Texas Park and Wildlife identifies the man as Carl Katzenberger of Montgomery. The vessel was carrying a total of 53 passengers. One witness says the boat capsized before they had a chance to help. So, I mean, it was a nice day. It was pretty calm. All of a sudden, the wind started picking up um, and we saw one of the barges out here. Within about five minutes, I think the water was crashing over on the inside. We saw it start tipping a bit, so we thought to come walk down here just to see if anyone might need some help. Um, and by the time we got down here, the boat pretty much capsized and everybody was floating in the water. All passengers and crew were accounted for following the incident. One woman went to a local hospital after having a panic attack. No other injuries were reported. The 23-year-old Colleen woman charged in connection to the murder of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen is entering a not guilty plea. According to court documents obtained by KRHD News, Aguilar's defense attorney submitted a waiver of arraignment on August 11th. Shortly after, the federal magistrate attempt accepted the plea. Aguilar is accused of helping Army Specialist Aaron Robinson dispose of Vanessa Guillen's body. Aguilar was re-indicted on 11 federal charges last month. There are still no court dates or hearings in the case. Guillen first went missing on April 22, 2020. COVID-19 vaccine mandates are becoming more common, but some employers aren't ready to go this far and are now considering insurance surcharges instead. These could be an estimated $20 to $40 per paycheck. Some companies feel like it gives employees more of a choice. They can, they can pay that surcharge and, and still remain unvaccinated, or maybe it nudges them towards uh, get, getting the vaccine, which, you know, from the employer's perspective, benefits all because then, you know, you get the rest of your workforce that much more comfortable with being on site or being, you know, at, at, the, at the workplace. Wade Simmons works with a consultancy firm that's based on employee benefits called Mercer. He says that he's been hearing from a growing number of employers in the last couple of weeks about insurance surcharges. He says it's mostly happening with employers who have to have their workers on site and it's in industries like manufacturing and retail. But he says companies don't necessarily want to be the first to do it. The only true uh, movement towards this direction that I've seen is employers that uh, have sort of a menu of options to either gain a reward or avoid a surcharge like um, you know, tobacco use and get a biometric screening, uh, take, a, take a health assessment and vaccination status has, has been added to that menu. He says Affordable Care Act rules would allow for an insurance surcharge if you aren't vaccinated and anti-discrimination laws related to vaccine status shouldn't apply to a surcharge. That's because they relate to the employee benefit plan, which is governed by federal law. Simmons believes having appropriate communication with employees about the surcharge would help with pushback, like letting them know it's about fairness because of the additional health care expenses that could come along with them being unvaccinated. You don't need to live near a wildfire to feel the impact of toxic smoke being pumped into the air. Children are among the most vulnerable. And as wildfire season collides with the Delta variant, health experts tell Amanda Brandeis that more work is needed to improve air quality in schools. So if you see where that house is up there, I don't live in that house, but I live right down below that house. A lifelong educator. Hi, Megan. Ron Calloway says teaching is the best job in the world. Because we make a difference. Someone taught you. Someone made a difference in your life. But he's been tested more in the last five years than his entire career. It was not in um, Administration 101. Now a superintendent, <laughs> he's lived in this Northern California town 60 years. Never thought twice about a fire in this area impacting us like it did. It was basically a torch, an 80 mile an hour torch going through this area. Hundreds of students and staff lost their homes in the 2017 fire. When we have a smoke day, that triggers a lot of emotion from students, so we have to be prepared for that as well. Now happening every year, Callaway had to become an expert in dealing with the toxic pollution. It's extremely toxic. I say this to other districts, be prepared. Something is going to eventually happen in your area. 
a concern and something that should be on everybody's radar because these fires are so enormous and overwhelming and the wind can blow them into other places. So Dr. Lisa Battelle says we're learning more about the impacts of smoke on children's health. What's burning in wildfires, you know, it's like an entire house goes up in flames, a car, and then it turns into these little particles that we inhale and breathe in. A pediatric study estimates wildfire smoke is 10 times more toxic to kids than other pollution putting them at risk for asthma, bronchitis, and pneumonia. It's important to clean up indoor air quality for kids' health. It always has been. Uh, it feels even more important now because of both COVID-19 and the wildfires. In every classroom. Callaway says lessons learned in his district can help other schools. Each classroom has an air scrubber to remove chemicals, toxins, and viruses from the air. 26 to 27 students. And all heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems have HEPA filters to remove dangerous particles. It's not too loud. Um, obviously, you can talk over it. About half the nation's public school districts need to upgrade or replace these systems. In some cases, they're creating hazardous conditions like mold. We would need significant investments to really bring school infrastructure up to snuff um, for kids when we were thinking about COVID in particular. But Dr. Patel says the pandemic led to state and federal dollars to improve ventilation. She encourages parents to get involved, create climate liaisons who can help apply for the funding needed to make the upgrades. Our schools are being asked to do a lot. Start the conversation, reach out to your principal to start and say, I'm worried about this. What are our school's plans? How can I help? Everything we do is about our children and making sure they're safe. Callaway says kids belong in the classroom and making sure they're safe is better for us all. You need to be prepared. In Santa Rosa, California. You need to have a plan. I'm Amanda Brandeis reporting. And we have seen a couple of isolated showers and thunderstorms across the area and a few of those moving right across our extra co eagle eye earlier this afternoon as well. So we may have a few raindrops to dodge before sunset and then things will start to quiet down. As far as the tropics are concerned, we do have tropical storm Fred making landfall. Look at that in just a second, but we're going to really start to concentrate on grace here, which is now south of the Dominican Republic thunderstorms are starting to fire closer to the center and, and it may strengthen as it starts to head toward Jamaica here. 35 mile per hour sustained winds gust of 45 moving west northwest at 13 miles per hour and the latest track on grace has this right now as a tropical depression and then moving close to Jamaica the Grand Cayman and then as we head toward the Yucatan Peninsula near hurricane strength then crossing overland again and then close to a hurricane here as it makes its way into Mexico. This track has shifted farther to the south. So it appears as of now, minimal effects will be here across the Brazos Valley as we head into the weekend. So as of now, things look like they will be south of us. We'll continue to track that. Of course, Fred making landfall earlier today as a tropical storm uh, just to the east of Panama City. That continues to roll up with lots of heavy rain rolling across Florida. Back here at home again, we've had a couple of showers and thunderstorms around here, but a disturbance out to the west is probably going to provide us with some better rain chances as we make our way into tomorrow. So in the morning, things pretty quiet, but we may bubble up a couple of thunderstorms for some scattered activity on Tuesday. Then going on into Wednesday, more scattered showers and thunderstorms will be possible. Rain chances about 40 to 50%. So keep the umbrella handy over the next couple of days as we will have those pop up thunderstorms around 94 going down to 92 on Wednesday and then Thursday into Friday, how about starting to see the decline in rain chances here? And that will go right into your weekend and next week's looking pretty hot with temperatures in the mid to upper 90s. The list of businesses now requiring proof of a COVID-19 vaccine or a negative test continues to grow. Gyms are part of that. Chris Conti takes a closer look at what you should pay attention to, whether you're going to a gym or just exercising in your neighborhood. One of the things about expectations through COVID is it's really evolved. Christina Tagliente and her brother Joey opened Row Republic in Boston back in 2019. The last two years have been filled with plenty of uncertainty. It's very unprecedented and it's very, um, it's a very unique situation. With cases of COVID continuing to rise, this small business joined a growing list of others and now requires every person who enters this studio, staff or client, to be vaccinated. 
They're not yet mandating masks since they aren't required by officials here in the city of Boston. Focus on what you can control. We fully acknowledge that the past couple weeks there has been a little bit of volatility um, in the COVID cases, but we know what we can do here at this studio to keep people safe is to require that all client staff, members, individuals, anyone who is on premise to be fully vaccinated. Rowers, are you ready? All right. Cities across the country are taking similar steps. L.A. and New York City are now requiring proof of vaccination for indoor dining and gyms. Larger gym chains like Equinox and SoulCycle are also now requiring people to be vaccinated if they want to work out. The expectation is get vaccinated, be vaccinated, do everything that you can um, to eliminate the risk. This virus is not going to disappear. We're going to have to suppress it. And the way to do that is to get vaccinated. That is Vanderbilt University's Dr. William Schaffner, one of the country's leading infectious disease experts. He sees gyms and other businesses requiring vaccines as a necessary next step in trying to once again contain COVID. I think we're now at the time where we also have to not only pull, but push. And we're going to oblige people to be vaccinated if they wish to participate in certain activities. Whether folks should be masking up again while working out, Dr. Schaffner says this. When I go to the gym, I'm breathing much more deeply. I'm exhaling much more. And I think if you can, wear that mask. It really does help protect you and the other people in the gym. What about other forms of exercise, though? Running, biking, anything outdoors does lower your risk dramatically. If you can keep your distance from others while running, your likelihood of catching COVID is pretty low. But if you're in groups, sometimes when I travel, I have to jog in a city and I'm weaving through people on the sidewalk. At that point, it becomes courteous to wear the mask. I love the power here. Let's go. Back at Roe Republic, they continue to monitor local health department recommendations while also hoping that that vaccine requirement not only keeps their gym members safe, but also pushes people who are holding out to get their shot in an effort to protect others. To encourage people to, to get vaccinated, I mean, the, the higher the rate and the higher velocity of people getting vaccinated, the lower the risk we're creating for everyone. As this and other gyms across the country continue to do whatever they can to keep people safe. Last two minutes of work, come on, take us home. While also helping them stay healthy. Open up your body to that right knee and wave to your neighbor. In Boston, I'm Chris Conti. With more places starting to require proof of vaccination, some people are trying to get around the requirement. In the past week, two men were arrested after they used fake vaccine documents to get into Hawaii. Now, the state attorney general's office is investigating other incidents just like these. But experts say these types of incidents will likely continue to happen. Because the, the vaccination cards are paper stock with black ink, it's very easy to duplicate. So what, we, what we've heard and what we've read about is that it's very difficult to distinguish a fake one from a real one. Right now, there's not much organizations can do to verify whether a document is fake or not. Some states do have technology in place that can verify whether someone's been vaccinated, but because the entire country is relying on paper cards with no watermark or anything else, the cards have been easy to duplicate. Experts at Checkpoint Software say that QR codes could actually help solve the issue even if we continue to use paper cards. If there's a sensor repository at some level that has a QR code that references an identity and then a positive or a you know, vaccination status that's complete, when you put those all together, that's the technology that was required to really have 100% verification that you are who you are and you have been either tested positive or negative or you've been vaccinated completely. Not all states have a system in place that would allow an easy transition to using QR codes, especially since people have been getting vaccinated since last year. Additional assistance is coming to families struggling to put food on the table. Benefits paid under the SNAP program are increasing. The average person will see about $36 extra a month in food assistance. The changes take effect in October. Here's some of the stories we're working on for Care HD News at 6. We'll take a deeper look into how Brazos Valley School Districts are preparing to give students proper nutrition this year. Plus a proposal in Washington to fix an emerging issue that affects many of our nation's veterans. These stories and more coming up at the top of the hour.
World News Tonight starts in just a few minutes, and we'll be back in 30 minutes for CARE HD News at 6. Until then, have a good evening.